without further ado, I am going to hand over to John O'Sullivan to take you through the content. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, as Joe said, we um, uh, we love doing these sessions at lunchtime. Um, I, I think, in particular, I was tempted when she said that to have a bite of sandwich. So you nearly caught me out there, Joe. Um, but um, um, I think they're they're it, they're really designed to just sort of provoke some thinking on your side of, you know, am I doing this right? Um, it's really hard when we are all so busy in our day-to-day -day working lives and we have emails and calls and videos or constantly back to back. So we always like to think of these things as an opportunity for half an hour just to step back for a couple of minutes and think about a particular topic. And what I often find is if I'm thinking about best practices and flexible working, my mind is going off into other things as well. So hopefully this will just be a good chance for you to reflect and um, uh, and just have a, a little uh, break during the day. So we are going to talk about uh, best practices and flexible working. As Joe said, we will send out both a, 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 a set of slides um, and a longer document that goes with that. So no need to scribble down. And, and what we like to do in our webinars is you know, we don't promote ourselves. We like to talk about content. We're very passionate about flexible working and part time, and we hope you find it useful. So let's just quickly look at the agenda. Um, we are going to talk about a couple of recruitment and retention challenges that some of you may be experiencing right now. Um, and then we're going to have a quick run through uh, the, the sort of four main areas. So recruiting and onboarding um, uh, flexible workers and managing them when they're working flexibly. And then also talking about briefly about managing teams that are working flexibly. Um, and we've all been through this. So particularly in the last couple of years, since lockdown's finished and um, uh, and the, you'll see some of the, some of the uh, um, slides are slightly content heavy. I'm not gonna read everything on the slides, but they're there for, if you like to read, they're there for you to read. If you like to listen, um, then just do that. Um, however, we're just not talking about our expertise today. And um, what we've done to put this webinar together and the guide that will follow it is talk to some of our clients, um, particularly those people who we know have embraced flexible working over a number of years. You'll see some of their names and logos on the screen there. But really, we were talking to them about what's worked for them and what may work for others that they do. Um, and we've had some wonderful um, uh, comments and recommendations back. And, I'll, and as you go through slides, you'll see some quotes that are coming out there from people who are working in practice doing this on a day-to-day -day basis. So just talking about sort of some of the areas around recruitment and retention at the moment, we'll kick off on the, on the right-hand side of this chart. And there's a couple of uh, quotes here from Sodexo, who did a survey last year. And a couple of really interesting areas, particularly if you are in a small or medium-sized business, and we always see that sort of up to sort of 500 employees, I think the government are now seeing it as 999. But um, just around flexibility, you know, three quarters of people are saying they're more likely to apply for a role if there's flexible hours or there's some sort of flexible working pattern. And we know at the moment with lots of HR people we're talking to that there is an issue on the number of candidates applying for roles. So the more attractive you can make a role, the more attractive you can make your business, the better. Um, but also particularly for, for smaller and growing businesses, um, the second quote there, after 52% of employees would rather work for a big corporation, um, nearly half of them said they were put off for working for a smaller business because of lack of flexibility. So there's that perception around smaller businesses that they are less flexible. And um, in our experience, it's the other way around often. You know, bigger companies will say, oh, we're very flexible, we've got great flexible work practices. But when it comes down to teams, um, it can be a bit more restrictive. But that's a perception that particularly smaller and medium-sized businesses have to overcome. Um, on the left-hand side, it's just all about retention. It's about, are you engaging your employees? Are you creating the right um, uh, environment for them? Are you, are you recognizing that the thing that people do most in their lives is work alongside sleep? You know, that's the majority of our lives is working and sleeping. So if that is not a, um, a good environment for people at the moment, then they very quickly, choose to do something else. And, um, and they need to keep up that retention. Um, Oxford Economics said that the cost of recruiting a professional um, uh, in any, any particular uh, sector can be between 28 and 40,000 pounds. 
So if somebody leaves, you have to re-recruit, you have to re-onboard, you have to get people up to speed. And that cost is between 20 and 30,000 pounds. So not just having a happy company, not just having a productive company, but engage employees who are gonna stay and be loyal is absolutely key. So let's move on to start thinking about flexibility. Um, and um, there's a great, great quote here from Fiona at RDT, who really highlighted in our survey that, you know, whereas before the pandemic, flexibility was often a women's issue. It was something that you know, many women needed, that a lot of employees were thinking that women in their business and women they were recruiting wanted flexibility, but men didn't. Um, that environment has very much changed. So when you're thinking about flexibility in your business, it applies to all of your people. Um, it's not just women. It's not just childcare anymore. There's an increasing amount of uh, caring for elderly parents. There's an increasing amount of people who want to do other things, whether that might be charitable activities or have other interests. That flexibility is increasing um, all the time. The demand for it is constantly rising. So it all kicks off with in incorporating flexibility into a role. And one of the things we often talk to our clients about is when you're either creating a new role or indeed re-advertising a role because somebody's left the business, is you should look at that job design and look at it critically. With a critical eye, you should think about what does this role need? Does it still, if someone's leaving, or if I'm thinking about something new, what are the functional needs? And the functional needs are primary, right? The job has to be done and it has to be done well. So all the other things surrounding that um, are you know, secondary at the most, but sit alongside it, but the job has got to be done. So you need the right person with the right skills, the right experience, the right attitudes to get the job done. Then you have to think about the flexibility that's gonna get the right employees and the right candidates to apply. And once you've got those, those applying, you've then got to think, okay, how do I bring them into the business? How do I make sure that when I'm going through a recruitment process, that I'm not only am I checking that I'm getting the right person in a flexible environment, but also that I'm selling my business to them because it, there is definitely a two-way street. You're selling to each other when you get into that area. But you start off with a really good, flexible job design. Um, it needs thinking through, it, it deserves a bit of time in your day to take that out. Um, and then make sure that flexibility is not just around the person, the job, but also works for the team and works for the business. So there's no point in somebody having great flexibility and that putting a huge amount of unexpected pressure on the rest of the team. And what you often find is that even if a whole team is working flexibly, some are working part time, just some tweaks and changes can make sure that that whole team is performing very well. So three things, make sure that that flexibility is built into the job design and make sure you're meeting the functional requirements. And thirdly, make sure that any flexibility meets the needs of the whole business and the team around them. Some great quotes there. Um, and I love the third one. You know, one of our clients, very practical, very down to earth, focused on skills, experience and values of the role um, and the individual. The desire to work from home is a secondary detail. And I think that's what we're trying to emphasize here is that that's got to be uh, the primary thing and flexibility can definitely work for pretty much every role. When we move on to that process of bringing those people in, there's a couple of things to think about here. I think everyone, you know, that's on, on, the, uh, on, on this session today, if you have recruited in the last couple of years, you've probably done some of it over video. Um, and if you've been interviewing, uh, if you've been recruiting in the last four years, you would have definitely done some over video because you couldn't have met face to face. Um, but the first thing we often talk about is if you are interviewing over video, the process of that video uh, session is really important to get right. Um, because if that in first contact, if that first interview doesn't work well, if the technology is not set up properly, if you're not adjusting how you interview and how you allow your uh, candidate to engage with you um, in the right way, then you may miss the perfect person. So we do have a guide. If you're interested, um, in just getting on, we have a short guide for this to just really sort of top 10 things to think about. And um, just either um, drop me an email when you see my email address at the end, or put something in the um, in the questions and we'll send that off to you. But but during that particular interview, there's a couple of things I wanted to um to highlight. So first of all, this is sort of soft skills. And um, 
you know, when we look at things like, um, you know, skills based interviewing and competency based interviewing, one of the things that's often missed out is the soft skills. And people think, oh, I, do you know what? I, I often pick up the soft skills from the interview. But when you're not face to face, sometimes picking up those soft skills can be a bit more challenging. So the things we like to think about are here's three things to test. Maybe ask a couple of questions around, which is, you know, how do you communicate? How have you found communicating in an environment which is primarily video based rather than face to face? How have you found your practices changing? What have you had to do to make those changes? So pick, try and pick up the effectiveness of your candidates' communication skills, because if they're not good at communicating in a remote environment that might be sometimes remote, sometimes an office, and then they're going to struggle from day one. The second one is teamwork. And I think in a hybrid environment, when you're, you may see some people some days, you may not see them for other for maybe a week or two in, in other areas, how people work as a team, how they consider their colleagues, and how they, um, uh, how can I put it, how they are empathetic to what's going on around them is vitally important. This whole area of collaboration, this whole area of recognising the needs of your colleagues is now becoming, particularly even in senior roles, um, you know, often people talk about gravitas in the senior role. What does that mean? It used to be maybe six foot two, white, male, you know, 50 years old was gravitas. Now people talk about gravitas, the ability to pull individuals and teams together from different places and get them working as a unit. If you can lead a team on that basis, that's gravitas. So teamwork, how do you draw those teamwork skills out of people? And then thirdly, personal organisation. And particularly if you're recruiting somebody on a part-time basis or somebody who may have a hybrid working pattern, is you want to check that they can organise themselves well and they're not chaotic, that they, um, that they understand that, you know, if they're working with different other people's working patterns, that they're fitting within that well and that they're capturing the things they need, they're using the tools that they need that you're making available to do the job well. So absolutely vital. And then as I mentioned earlier, the third one, sell the culture and working environment and make sure that you're, you're realistic about doing that is the only thing I would say is don't oversell because as soon as someone steps into the business, they'll realize that the delivery and the practicality of what you were saying, is it there or isn't it there? And, and what we do find is that people are much more willing um, to walk out of a business now soon into their employment than they were before. And that's not just a pandemic, that's just purely working culture now. Um, is that people won't tolerate um, being oversold to during the recruitment process. So under, ma- ensuring that you are doing the right things and then selling that culture work environment is really important. So some great quotes I hope you might have been able to read um, on the left-hand side. Um, uh, concentrate on communication skills in particular. Um, highlight the work-life balance. You know, talk through what a day might look like. Um, some really good uh, tips here. All of these um, uh, quotes are in the, the guide that we will also send you. Um, onboarding um, is oh just that early stage. You know, we, you know, if anyone on the call has had more than two or three jobs, we've probably been in one where you've gone into an office, sat down on your first day, looked around, you know, nobody's introduced you to people, they've given you a pile of documents to read, your laptop's not arrived yet, you haven't got an email address yet, you know, you're sitting there, your first two days are A unproductive and B you start thinking about, you know, is this a good company or not? You know, what have I done? And it's a really sensitive time for new employees, which is you want them to buy in really quickly to your business. You want them to interact with their colleagues really quickly. And you want them to become productive as quickly as you possibly can. So successful onboarding is really important. Um, Some of the, a, a lot of the recommendations we had from clients were that even if you're fully remote, Are there ways that you can organize some in-person meetings, some face-to-face meetings at an early stage? So whether it is with key individuals and colleagues or teams, or is there a team meeting coming up where you can say, you know, it's not for three or four weeks, but, you know, talk to people on video, but put this in your diary, you will meet the team. So how can you draw that person into the team and make them feel um, belonging as quickly as possible? And so, you know, many larger companies now talk about belonging as a really important part of that employee experience, and you want them to feel that they belong. Um, 
think about the, the, the team's requirements as well, not just the onboarding needs of the new person, but what will the team need to do? Who does the team need to meet? Um, what's the working pattern? Make sure that the communications is all working around that very early stage. And as I said earlier, have that technology ready. Um, you know, there's nothing really to stop us from setting up emails to having a laptop primed. You know, if somebody's going to be working remotely, are you getting the laptop to them 48 hours before they start? Is it going to arrive? Or is it going to be caught up in some, you know, Amazon nightmare <laughs> where it gets them a couple of days before and needs a little bit of forward thinking? So we're going to move on now for a couple of minutes to um, managing flexible people and flexible teams. And this is where we had some really practical advice. And I think, you know, management is um, uh, somebody was saying we did a podcast with a guy, Francis, from Virgin Money um, a couple of weeks ago. And he was saying, you know, the thing that always frustrates him as a senior HR professional is that um, he'd say to leaders and directors, you know, tell me about your managers. How good are your managers? And he go, oh, yeah, they're a bit of a mixed bunch. And he was saying, you know, just not good enough. You know, managers have a very hard thing to do. They have a variety of people to manage. They have, they often have a day job of their own and they're often trying to deliver what might be some changing goals in a changing market environment. So the manager is the, is the is a fulcrum of, of making organizations work. And, um, and when we think about them managing flexible people and teams, in some ways that can be more challenging than whether you've got people in the office with you every day. Now, the idea of, oh, I have everybody with me every day. We did an exercise before where we asked people to count up the number of hours in their diary. They were actually sitting with their team every day. And in one company, um, one of the team managers said, oh, I have about two hours a week when I'm actually in the office. So his requirement was, I like to see the team. I like to know what they're doing. It was never there. So, um, so it was something that he thought he had, but he didn't actually have that control. So managing flexible people, it, it often comes back to this over communications. So checking in with people in mornings, um, if they're not gonna be in the office, making sure that, um, particularly in the early stages, so you may have gone through the sort of formal, you know, onboarding point, but making sure that, you know, people are well, that people feel that they understand what's required of them, that you're feeding back to them, that you are, um, that the team are talking in a good way. Communications at the moment is absolutely so vital in what we're doing. Um, and, um, and performance management is, you know, is I think, if anything, from a, from a manager's perspective, the thing that they should take most attention on at the moment. So making sure everybody understands what's expected of them from a goals perspective, um, giving them regular feedback about how they're getting on with those goals, not just, you know, have you, have you achieved your objective? Has that project been finished? But how are you doing, how are you doing the goal? I've recognized, you know, I've had feedback from your colleagues, or I've noticed this, or you said you were on, you were concerned about this. How are you giving that sort of regular feedback to people and checking in with people on a regular basis? You know, many or many managers will do maybe a sort of formal meeting, if particularly if they're busy personally, maybe once or twice a month, um, or once or twice a quarter sometimes. Um, but just that, you know, making sure that once a week you are checking in. I thought we'd spend 10 minutes just seeing how things are going um, is vital when you are, once again, in a, in a remote environment in particular. Because what we tend to do is on video is we go through our agenda. You know, we don't have that, you know, I say call it water cooler moment. We don't have a time when we're just sitting there in the morning making a cup of tea when we get into the office. You know, that checking that people used to informally do um, is now to, uh, to all intents and purposes, many companies gone. So if you're only together maybe once a week face to face or once a fortnight or once a month face to face, you still don't get that informality. So as a manager, just doing those check-ins with your people, how's it going? Anything that um, I can help you with, um, making sure that they are um, that they are comfortable and that they are productive is good. And then finally, so, sorry, John, just to interject, yeah. there's a really nice question, a really good question that's come in, um, expanding on that point and mm. talking about the the kind of um, the relationships in the wider team and obviously people's time being very precious. How would you? suggest a manager might go around replicating those water 
cooler moments across the team rather than just between the manager and um, employee relationship? Yeah, it, it is a really good question. Um, you know, by inference, when you are in a remote environment, you can't have a water cooler moment because you're not physically there and around them. Um, some, some organizations that um, we've worked with have done some quite interesting things. One of them does a sort of a wind down Friday session. And, um, and what they'll do is they'll get as many people as possible. That's not compulsory, but they'll get everyone on a call 4.30 on a Friday. Um, and they will just ask people, they'll either have a theme, which is, you know, your food you love most, the food that, you know, you wouldn't touch, or they'll have a something like a, you know, a good and bad for the week. You know, what's what's been your highlight? What's been your low light? And um, and that in particular is a theme. Is it often it often enables the team to highlight good things that have happened in the company that week that people might have missed. So we had this feedback from a customer, or um, we had an operational issue and we fixed it in less than an hour. That was my personal highlight. You know, and all of a sudden, then people start to share that and understand it, which might have been missed otherwise. And excuse me. And in my experience, this idea of a a low light is sometimes it brings to light some problems that might have occurred in the company that have not been discussed, or somebody saying, you know, this meeting really didn't go well, or something. And often, what I saw was people then reaching out to those people afterwards, saying, "Let me know if you need any help." So it's those invisible things that you don't pick up on you know, those, those pointers in a physical environment, that's something like a wind down Friday. And actually what this company used to do was to say, okay, it's five o'clock, you know, laptops down, unless you're doing something really important, let's leave the week here. So it was a nice early finish. It was a sort of firm close to the week. And the chief exec would just talk about what was going on next week. So everybody sort of had in their mind what the priorities were in the coming week. It was a really nice way of doing it. So those sorts of informal sessions, I think they're good where there's no real fixed agenda, um, but you're just getting together. And, and often, you know, we do know when you're sitting together as a group, it's hard for everyone to, to, to join in. Some people are less likely to that. So maybe a theme is a really good way of doing it. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so I think the final thing that I would just say um, in terms of managing flexible people um, is making sure that in, around the check-ins and the performance mentions that you're talking about, personal professional development. And we did a project with a large company um, towards the end of last year um, where we were asking their ex-employees why they left. And uh, their ex-employees loved the business, um, but what they, the reason that they left was that they didn't feel that they had a good personal development program or a career path. Um, and you know, it was just a great indicator that you know, people want to develop as people. They want to develop their professional skills. They want to know that there are ways that they can do their job more effectively through development. And making sure you give time for that is really, really key. And moving on to teams for a couple of minutes. Once again, I think the first point to make is what over communicate again. Um, I don't think we ever communicate enough. I think sometimes when you meet a really good communicator and somebody communicates really frequently, you realize sometimes how. Um, how, uh, uh, well, I realise how deficient I can be in that area sometimes. I just assume people know things, but sometimes you just have to make that one step further and make sure they know. Um, going back to the point you just made, Joe, facilitate those informal interactions and don't let things become functional. Um, and, you know, we're, we're firm uh, believers in the use of numbers um, to help people understand where they are in the business. So whether that might be is the, is the company achieving its targets? Are projects working on time? You know, just allow people to help to recognize their own priorities and where they might be spending their time differently um, and making sure people can structure their week around goals and teams around goals. So, you know, once you realize that a team, even if it's a whole company, has a particular goal, it allows people to structure in their minds um, what the, um, their, their own priorities should be. I think team performance, um, when we talk about the, these highs and lows, but, but calling out, I think, uh, great examples of performance, I think is really valuable. Once again, it, it used to be something where somebody would go, oh, Joe, great job on that last week. As you walk through the office, you go, that was brilliant. And what Joe heard was 
great job. So that was good for her. And what everyone else heard was, great job, Joe. So not only was, you know, Joe's doing a good job, but also someone in the team is getting, you know, great feedback. When you take that out and you're too functional, you forget to highlight some of those um, team and individual performances. So when you are getting together, sometimes it's good even just to start a session with, you know, before we start, you know, I talked to Joe last week about what a brilliant job she did on this project. Um, and I asked if I could share that story with you. And I just want to talk about it. Sometimes be very careful about putting people on the spot. Or you might say, for example, um, about the technology team getting a new product feature to market twice as quick as it did. You know, it just once again raises the bar a little bit. And some great um, um, some quotes here, open communication, clear instruction, empathy and kindness is a really, you know, that's one quote from a person. And it's a lovely summary for this whole area. Mm. Open communication, clear instruction, empathy and kindness. It's great. Joe. There's a sorry, there's a question that's come in that I think is really brilliant question, but also a very, very difficult area at the moment. Um, yeah. The question is, uh, what is your advice on integrating part time or remote employees when the majority of employees are office and full time? Now, we've seen this difficulty. Have you got any thoughts or advice on, on how to make that work? Um, y yes, I mean, we, we have lots and, and um, happy to you know, even have a call with this person afterwards if that's something that they'd like. Um, there are some things there where, um, as we said, think of the needs of the team. Um, what we often find is that um, when somebody is part time, uh, you need to you need to be very clear on what the deliverables are going to be on both sides, on the full time and the part time. You need to make sure that the communications are working well. So if somebody's working on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and you have your team meeting on a Thursday, um, uh, or you or you get together on your monthly team meeting on a day when they're not there, then everything starts to become disconnected. So I think what you have to do is, is be very deliberate about how you how tasks are completed. So for example, if somebody's doing three days a week, then if there needs to be a handover, that handover at the end of a Wednesday, let's say to do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they need to know who they're handing things over to. The person they're handing over to needs to know to expect it. So th that needs to be, you know, collaborative from that perspective. And the handover needs to be um, enough, enough, in, enough instruction and guidance for that to be done. So if, Joe, if you said to me at the end of Wednesday, in fact, we do this, the 10 to 2 team are 100% remote and nearly 90% part time. Um, and we work on teams all day. And I can see um, the coordination sessions that happen amongst the team. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm finishing today. This has to be picked up tomorrow. Somebody will pick it up. Once again, it's that communication that happens on the handover. So if the job is designed well, the job can be done Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but inevitably it's going to be things that might need to be done on a, on a Thursday and Friday. And I'm just giving one example of a part-time format there. Just think through the communications, think through any handover requirements, think through what the customer might expect. Um, if, for example, there's some customer facing elements, but in our experience, it works very effectively as long as as long as those processes are put in place. Once again, I'm happy to pick that up um, at a later stage, given the timing. So we've Thanks, got John. minutes that we had in the slot. I'll finish off what I was saying here. And then, um, as I said, if there are any questions that we can't ask for the time, we'll come back to the group. We'll we'll uh, we'll give answers to them. Um, just once again, want to pick up um, another one of the quotes on the left-hand side. Um, you know, this whole area around uh, the third quote there, making sure you put in place an effective method for the team to communicate and share information. So this is also where the part-time and full-time works. How is information going to be shared? Is something, for example, that you are doing, um, you know, if there are documents that the person who's part-time um, uh, might have that the others might not have, and they're not available all week, then is that maybe on OneDrive? Um, is it using a shared platform that those documents are available to everybody, not just the person who might not be working? So if you think about, if you've never worked with part-time people before, just think about what happens when someone's on leave. You know, it's the same sort of processes, really. If I'm going away for two weeks, I hand over, I make sure the documents are there. I know my customers 
if I'm customer facing, know what to expect. I know what the project team is going to be doing while I'm away. Um, so it's the same sort of process. Um, I'm just going to say, I'm not even going to talk for long about this. There are, you know, there are legal and um, statutory things that you need to think about around flexible working. Um, I think when you have a mix of working patterns, having a policy so that every bond understands, you know, the starting point is absolutely critical. So a flexible working policy um, is, I think, is important as a, as a base case. Um, the operating processes, we just talked about that, who, how and when is the company working? Um, think about your flexibility. Is it formal or informal? Does something need to be written into a, an employment contract? Or are you happy to, or and your employees happy to just have some formality? I mean, we know organisations where they're massively informal. You know, if, as long as you do what you have to do, we don't care where you are, we don't care when you're logged in. You know, these are your goals, and if you achieve your goals, you're doing a great job, and the company is going to be productive. You know, that's the ultimate. Um, and actually, I will um, when we send out the uh, the documents, I will send with it a link to Virgin Money's new uh, flexible working policy. <clears throat> um, and they're very virgin about it. Um, and, you know, as you expect the sort of virgin organisation to be, you know, they have 30 days leave. They, I think they have another 20 days discretionary leave. Then on top of that, they have other well-being days off. They have, you know, they, ha they have no rules around, around location. Um, really interesting, but they've done a load of research around it, and I'll, I will share that with you. Um, and then also, if you're in an environment where somebody may put in a, a formal flexible, flexible working request, um, there is a procedure in there. Um, in the guide we send out, there's a one pager from um, a, a, an organisation we do a lot with called Machins, which is a, a Luton based uh, legal practice um, around flexible working requests. So take a look at that and, and talk to them if you need any more guidance. Um, and finally, I'm going to finish off with um, a quote from Nicola at CPS, um, who, you know, I sort of, I, I really loved it. And um, actually, I think Nicola might, might have been joining the, the webinar today. I'm not sure she did or not. But so, uh, you know, I don't want to, um, uh, I'll pick her up here. But I loved it. Lead, don't manage. Share the highs, learn from the lows, listen and praise. And I think that summarises pretty much everything we've talked about in the last um, uh, 30 minutes. And you know, when we think about you know, what's going on in, in the environment today with the, both on businesses, you know, the, the latest ONS um, uh, data talking about still issues around supply of products, around you know, the cost of products put, pushing prices up, um, and then the whole cost of living um, uh, uh, crisis that people are experiencing. Um, it, it, it does demand that we manage people, not just the work. So that's not changed from before, it's just we need to do it more deliberately now. So, thank you. I've put a couple of um, email addresses up here. Um, Jane, that some of you will know, um, you can contact me on email, um, and Joe is just joe at timstu.org. So I hope you've been able to take something from this today.